So, good morning, everybody. For those that we are here, and uh, for all of uh, the rest who is uh, online, we are very happy today to have with us Francesca Fragudi. That uh, all of you that are working in the dynamics uh, know her already. For the rest, let me say a few things. Francesca got uh, his bachelor degree in uh, Bristol University. And then uh, he did her master thesis in astrophysical cosmology in Spain, in Barcelona. Uh, her PhD in astrophysics with uh, Lea Thanasula in Marseille at LAM. And then there is a series of uh, postdoctoral uh, uh, positions in uh, Observatoire de Paris, in Max Planck Institute, and at ESO in Garching in Munich. Uh, she was in, then an ESO fellow, and now, since 2022, assistant professor at Durham University in the UK. Uh, she is an expert in uh, everything that has to do with uh, n body models, galaxy formation, galact galactic dynamics, and all that stuff. And uh, you already see what this here. Okay, and you see the title. On the screen now, Bart Galaxies in Lambda CDM. Uh, and we're going to listen to the talk right now. Francesca, please go ahead. Thank you, Panos. Can you hear me well? Yes, yes, yes. Good. Okay, great. Good. So, so uh, Calimera or Calomesimeri for those of you in Athens. Um, thanks, thanks very much for, for having me um, uh, remotely to, to give this talk. And uh, I'm looking forward to, to meeting many of you in person um, when I'll be in Athens in September uh, at the Academy. So um, as Pano said, the title of my talk <clears throat> is Bright Galaxies and Lambda CDM. Um, and in particular, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about the work that we've been doing um, uh, with simulations in order to try and uncover the formation history of our Milky Way, but also the dark matter content of uh, barred Milky Way-like galaxies. Um, and I'll be telling you a little bit about how we use uh, both um, isolated and cosmological simulations to, to study this. And I just wanted to highlight uh, my collaborators and also in, in bold here, um, some of the early career researchers who I work with, um, whose work I'll be touching upon at various points in, in this talk. Um, so I'm, I'm sure that uh, an introduction to, to, to BARD is not needed for most of you there, but um, for those not working on, on BARD dynamics or for any um, undergraduate students, I'm going to start with uh, quite a broad introduction on the topic, and then I'll go into some of the uh, specifics. So um, as we all know, bars form due to instabilities in, in stellar disks, and they can transfer angular momentum from the inner regions of the galaxy outwards. Um, and so if a, if a galaxy can form a bar, it will want to form a bar in order to, to have this transfer of angular momentum outwards. Um, and for this reason, a, um, a large number of spiral galaxies in the local universe actually have host these um, elongated structures, these bars. Um, so the, the number of the bar fraction varies according to, to different studies, but in general, um, uh, most studies find that between half and two thirds of disk galaxies in the local universe have have bars, and this also includes our own Milky Way, which is a barred galaxy as well. Um, now, uh, the bar, the, the fraction of bars is, is is high, as I said, in the local universe, and a number of studies, uh, starting from from the work of um, earlier works such as uh, that of Sheth et al. and other subsequent works, have been finding that um, the fraction of bars um, decreases as we go towards higher redshifts. Um, and there is a recent work by Zoe Leconte, who is a, a PhD student here at Durham, who looked at uh, data from JWST to probe even higher redshifts and found that if we look at redshifts about 1.5, there are already about 20% of disk galaxies that host um, bars at these high redshifts and about 15% if we go towards even higher redshifts. Um, also using kind of galactic archaeology uh, methods, there's been um, some recent studies, for example, the study by Camila de Safreitas, who is an ESO fellow, um, who found um, when uh, looking at galaxies such as NGC 1433, this is a massive spiral galaxy, 
uh, and using um, kind of galactic archaeology methods to to date um, the bar, the age of the bar, found that in this galaxy the bar is very old, uh, older than about seven point five giga years. While for our, our own Milky Way, there is recent work by Jason Sanders and collaborators who has uh, also dated the uh, age of the bar in the Milky Way and also found that the bar of the Milky Way is quite old, uh, or older than about eight giga years. So bars uh, seem to be already in place at quite high redshifts, so redshifts um, 1.5 and above, and they're therefore affecting their galaxies over very long time scales. Um, now, before I go into telling you how they can affect their galaxies and, and kind of the rest of the talk, I wanted to say a few words about what bars are actually made of. Um, so um, we, bars are these elongated stellar structures that we see in the central regions of galaxies, but what are these actually made of? Well, they're made of resonant um, orbits. So um, here you can see three examples of uh, resonant orbits in a barred galaxy. These are taken directly um, from a cosmological simulation. And on the left, you see these three orbits in an inertial frame of reference. And in the right, you see these same three orbits in a rotating frame of reference. And resonant orbits are those that satisfy this resonant condition that tells us that the uh, radial frequency with which stars move inwards and outwards um, and the azimuthal frequency with which stars move around the galaxy in the rotating, rotating frame of reference, when these are commensurate, then we get this, um, these kinds of resonant orbits. And you can see that in the rotating frame of reference, these are almost um, closed orbits. And in particular, within the bar region themselves, we have these kinds of orbits that are moving, um, these kinds of bar supporting orbits, resonant orbits that are moving up, up and down within the bar itself. Um, and these uh, these orbits are, are very special. So um, these are part of the, the X1 family of orbits. Um, and in order to study orbits, one kind of um, uh, type of uh, resonant orbits that we uh, commonly study are these stable closed periodic orbits, which are really uh, make up the backbone of, of stellar bars. And here you can see one such uh, closed periodic orbit, um, for example, in a, in, in a bar potential. Uh, and this is in the XY projection. And we can study these uh, orbits by looking at how they um, are distributed or clustered in a characteristic diagram, such as the one you see here, where you have the Jacobi energy on the x-axis and um, where the orbit cuts the y-axis on the y-axis itself. And so one of these closed periodic orbits would be just a, a single point in this kind of diagram. And um, within a bar galaxy, of course, we have um, uh, many of these kinds of orbits of different energies. And when they, uh, and essentially they, all of these different orbits lie close together on a line. And these make up these different families of closed periodic orbits. So for example, here uh, we can see what the X1 family of closed periodic orbits would look like in this kind of diagram. Um, and um, yeah, we call we call these closed periodic orbits the backbone of stellar bars because they can trap around them um, regular non-closed orbits, um, such as the one that you see here, or as the one that you can see here at the top. And it's these kinds of orbits um, that really shape the stellar and gaseous distribution in the inner regions of of barred galaxies, and that really drive the evolution of barred galaxies themselves. So how do these, uh, how does this kind of uh, very interesting and complex orbital structure within Bart spiral galaxies drive the late time evolution of galaxies? Well, um, bars can induce um, shocks uh, in the gas uh, that's found in, in, in galaxies. And this shocks, these shocks uh, cause the gas to lose angular momentum and funnel to the central region along these dust lanes, where it will pile up in the central regions um, and lead to bursts of star formation and form uh, bar-built nuclear structures. Um, so it can really shape the inner regions of galaxies. Um, this uh, gas that's pushed to the center of galaxies can also help to build up a reservoir for AGN activity, which is uh, very important, especially at late times in the evolution of galaxies when there's not other kind of torquing mechanisms um, really available to push gas to the center. Um, bars can also redistribute stars within the disk themselves through these different kind of resonances, um, such as the quartation or the outer limb resonance. 
And they also, uh, bars can also form these structures in the inner regions that are called boxy peanut bulges. And I'm just going to spend a few a couple of minutes talking about these as they'll be important for what I'll be uh, saying later on. So what are these um, boxy peanut bulges? So as stars um, move around the galaxy, they also oscillate in the vertical direction up and down. And if this vertical oscillation is commensurate with um, uh, the bar frequency, then we will also get these kinds of resonances, but vertical resonances these times. So for example, we can have a resonant two to one orbits that can be get distorted out of the plane of the disk into, for example, banana, the so-called banana shaped orbits. Um, and here I'm going to show you an example of uh, an orbit of a, of, a, of a star in a simulation that gets trapped into this kind of vertical resonance. So this is showing you the galaxy edge on and the, this orbit will be shown um, edge on in a rotating frame of reference. So you see that initially um, this star is uh, moving basically around the galaxy and it stays quite confined close to the plane of the galaxy but it soon gets trapped by the bar into this kind of vertical resonance. And you can see how this orbit is heated basically out of the plane of um, the galaxy into this kind of uh, banana or pretzel shaped orbit. Um, and the collective response of all of these um, orbits is what gives rise to an X shaped or peanut shaped bulge that we um, see in many observations of, of edge on spiral galaxies. Um, here, I'm gonna be showing you a movie, again, from an n-body simulation. This is showing you the stellar surface uh, density face on on the top and edge on on the bottom. And you see, this is originally a disk that's axisymmetric. And um, if we let it evolve self consistently, it forms a bar and a boxy peanut. So um, I'm just rotating the bar here to always be along the x-axis because I want you to focus on the bottom panel here where we see, um, so a bar has formed. And if we focus on the bottom panel here, we see that after some time of evolution, I'm just gonna speed this up a bit. Uh, we see that after some time of the evolution of the bar, we form this kind of X shape or peanut shape structure, um, uh, which is not there uh, in the beginning and which is formed due to these uh, vertical instabilities in the bar region. So, um, Apart from um, kind of affecting the evolution of, of the galaxy themselves, which makes bars very interesting, um, bars are very interesting to study as well because the formation and the properties of bars are really tightly related to the properties of the dark matter halo itself. So for example, there, um, uh, the work of uh, Oshreker and Peebles in the 70s showed that massive halos can stabilize the disk against bar formation. Um, and also um, the subsequent, subsequent work by Twain and Weinberg showed that massive halos can slow down bars through dynamical friction. Um, so dynamical friction is uh, when we have a kind of drag force due to gravity. So if uh, this was first formulated by Chandra Secker in the 40s, um, where he said, if you have a massive uh, kind of object particle moving through a sea of low mass particles, um, this, um, this uh, high mass particle will, will, will be will attract these low mass particles, um, let's say behind it as it moves through them. But also of course, they these low mass particles are also exerting a, a pull on the high mass particle. And so um, there's a kind of gravitational friction force as this particle moves through this, this high mass particle moves through this sea of low mass particles that slows down um, that slows down this particle. Um, and that we have this kind of um, dynamical friction also when we um, consider um, bars moving through a, a halo made up of very low mass particles. Um, but um, in the case of a spherical system, uh, this dynamical friction is exerted by uh, near resonant particles, um, as was shown by Germain and Weinberg in the 80s. Um, and what this means effectively is that bars can also trap dark matter particles in resonance as well as they can um, trap uh, also um, stars in the disk, for example, in resonance. And he, here you see um, one uh, dark matter particle that is at resonance uh, with uh, a quotation resonance with um, the bar in a simulation. Okay, so that's it for the kind of um, uh, introduction uh, part. So then I'll go 
on to the two main topics that I want to touch upon, which is on to tell you a little bit about how we can use simulations to understand more about the formation history of a barred galaxy like the Milky Way, and um, then what we can tell about the dark matter content of barred galaxies. Um, uh, of course, the Milky Way is, of course, our favorite barred galaxy, and because we can study it in um, incredible detail. So learning about this is, is really interesting for learning about barred galaxies in general. So if we want to explore um, the formation of our galaxy, the best, best way to go and look is in the inner regions of, of galaxies, because these are, of course, um, the first to assemble within a kind of hierarchical model of galaxy formation. Um, and when we look at the central regions of galaxies, we tend to find kind of on, on two opposite sides of the spectrum, we find on one hand, these so-called um, classical bulges, which are dispersion dominated kind of spheroids um, that are thought to form through rather violent processes, um, such as for example, through mergers um, and also um, clump migration might be another way in which these can form. And on the other kind of, uh, side of the spectrum, we have these structures um, that we were just discussing, boxy peanut bulges, um, and these uh, form through secular um, mechanisms, as I was just discussing. So these form through disk instabilities and through resonances. They don't need uh, a merger, for example, to form. Um, so the different formation histories uh, of these structures leave very different chemodynamical imprints on stellar populations in the inner regions. And so by going and modeling the chemodynamical properties of stellar populations in, in the bulge of the Milky Way, we can try and actually understand how the Milky Way itself formed. So what do we know about um, the bulge of the Milky Way? Well, um, in terms of its morphology, we, we know that it has this kind of X-shaped structure. And if you uh, squint a little bit, you can see this uh, kind of X-shaped structure in the center there. And in terms of its kinematics, we also know that its kinematics are consistent with it being this boxy peanut or X-shaped bulge because it has um, cylindrical rotation, which is a feature of these kinds of boxy peanut bulges. However, if we um, go and look at the chemistry of the bulge of the Milky Way, there is a really a broad um, range of metallicity. So if we look at one window towards the bulge, this is, um, at Bade's window, and this is from the work of Zoccoli et al. in 2008, we see that stars have a really broad range of metallicities um, from you know, very supersolar to, to uh, minus one and even a little bit below. And this broad range of metallicities points to the coexistence of multiple stellar populations in, in those regions. And there's kind of a broad consensus that these metal-rich populations are um, the same, these metal-rich populations that we see in the bulge they're the same population that makes up the disk, that makes up the bar, and that makes up the boxy peanut that we see in the Milky Way. But there's uh, been less uh, of a kind of clear consensus on what the origin of these metal poor populations could be. Um, and there's kind of two main um, ideas of what this metal poor population could be. One is that this metal poor population could be a, a part of a kind of dispersion dominated spheroid or what, what we call a classical bulge. Um, so you would have the Milky Way being kind of a composite galaxy, having both a boxy peanut and a, a spheroidal um, population in the center. Um, and on the other hand, another idea is that this, these metal poor populations could actually just be the same population as the metal poor thick disk of the Milky Way that we see at the solar, at the solar neighborhood, but just continued into the inner regions of the galaxy. And uh, um, an important kind of distinction between these two scenarios is that um, in this scenario on the right, so if, if, if these metal pore populations are just the hot thick disk, what that's saying is that basically we can explain everything we see in the bulge of the Milky Way um, just with um, what we see in the disk. So there's no need for any additional kind of population or any additional formation mechanism for the bulge apart from what we see in the disk. Um, so it would be a pure disk scenario. Whereas on, when this scenario here on the left, this is telling us that there is an additional population in the inner regions of the galaxy that is cannot be explained with what we see in the disk, and that there is some other um, formation scenario for kind of for this inner regions as compared to the disk. So to explore um, this scenario, 
Um, so whether um, the, the metal pore population of the, in the Bollinger of the Milky Way, Milky Way could be due to this, um, could be just the same population as the thick disk. Um, a few years ago, uh, we, uh, with Paula Di Matteo and Misha Haywood, when I was a postdoc in Paris, we asked the question, um, can we reproduce the properties of the Milky Way bulge by just having a galaxy that has a thin and a thick disk? So if we have a pure disk formation scenario for the bulge. And so what we did was we went and we used tailored or isolated simulations of a disk galaxy uh, where we uh, built um, we built a, a disk for this galaxy that had the properties of the disk of the Milky Way, meaning that we um, we built a disk uh, that had a, um, a hot population that had a hot, large vertical scale height. So this, this plot in the background is from um, Bovietal in 2012 that looked at the disk of the Milky Way. And what he found is that um, in, in the Milky Way, we have a, a thick disk, so uh, populations with high vertical scale length, scale height and short scale length that are very metal poor. So the color coding here is the metallicity. And we also have um, stellar populations in the disk that are thin. So they have a small vertical scale height and they have longer scale length. And th these are uh, metal rich. So we built a, a simulation where we have these three disk populations where we have scale lengths, scale heights and metallicities um, that are comparable uh, with what we see in, in the disk of the Milky Way. So we, we built this kind of simulation with a thin and a thick disk. And then what we do is we, we let this simulation evolve self-consistently with time, um, form a bar um, as, as you were seeing before. And then this bar eventually also forms a boxy peanut as well. And then we essentially observe the, uh, we place the sun uh, you know, uh, as where we think it is in the Milky Way. And then we observe um, this, uh, the bulge in this model and see if we can reproduce what we see in the bulge of the Milky Way. So we looked at a few different things. We looked at the morphology, kinematics and chemistry. I won't have time to go through all of these. So I just wanna highlight a couple of results. So we, we explored what would happen to um, the, what, what the morphology of the bar and peanut, boxy peanut look like when we um, look at this kind of model. And of course, because of the simulation, we can separate out the cold thin disk and the hot thick disk at the end of the simulation as well. And you can see that in the cold population, the thin disk, um, the bar is much more stronger than in the, is much stronger than in the hot thick disk. And the peanut is a lot more pronounced also than in the hot, uh, hot component. Um, and if we now go and, 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 you know, we, we assign metallicities to these two populations, according to the fact that the hot thick disc is more metal poor and the cold thin disc is more metal rich. That's what we see in the Milky Way. So if we go and assign metallicities to these populations, we can actually construct a metallicity map for these simulations. And this is, uh, what we did in this, in, in, in this plot here. So this is showing you the simulation in galactic longitude and latitude color coded by metallicity. Um, and you see that in this kind of model, um, we have a vertical metallicity gradient that's negative. So we, we, we go to lower metallicities as we move to higher latitudes and we have this high metallicity in the disc. And um, the reason for this kind of uh, metallicity map is because of how the, um, these different disks um, are, are distributed. So if we look at the surface density fraction, um, so for the thin disk, uh, we have a high fraction of stars in close to the plane, because that's where the thin disk dominates. So a light color is a high fraction. Whereas for example, for the thick disk, which would be the low met lowest metallicity one, um, we have this, um, we have a higher fraction of stars at high latitudes. And so this is what gives rise to this metal poor uh, region at high latitudes. So in this kind of composite disk model, the thin metal rich disk dominates close to the plane and the metal poor thick disk dominates far away from the plane. Now we can go and compare what this actually looks like in, in the data. So this is now looking at apogee uh, data for the, for the inner regions of the Milky Way. And this is what our galaxy, uh, the metallicity map for our galaxy looks like. So we see that there is this vertical negative metallicity gradient and also a, a metal rich uh, disc, um, uh, inner disc component. 
And um, what we did here was to take our model and kind of apply the selection function of Apogee onto it. And you see very similar trends in this model. So you see a negative metallicity gradient and this uh, metal rich uh, thin disk dominating close to the plane. And we also looked at the alpha abundances as well and find again, very good agreement between this the trends that are seen for, for Apogee, for the bulge of the Milky Way and this kind of model that's just made up of a thin and a thick disk. And you can even go and look at this in more detail. And what, so what we did was to look at in each of these fields in the bulge, we went and we actually looked at the metallicity distribution function in each field. So on this is showing you the, 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 the MDF in each field. So each panel here is one field. And the red color is the data from Apogee and the blue line is the model that we have here. And you can see that the trends uh, and the model agree quite well with what we see in the data. So for example, we have these uh, two populations, the metal rich and the metal poor one. As we move to uh, um, further out in the disk, we see that the metal rich population, which is the thin disk, it starts to dominate. And this is well reproduced by the model. And as we move to larger heights um, or larger lat latitudes, the metal poor population um, begins to dominate more. And um, just to note that this, this model was not constructed to fit this data. The model was constructed to look like the disk of the Milky Way. And here we are exploring the bulge. So the model just um, kind of naturally reproduces what we see in the bulge. Um, so the metal rich and metal poor populations in the Milky Way bulge are indeed compatible um, with being the extension of the thin and the thick disk as uh, seen in the inner regions of the galaxy. And so this would, would um, suggest that the thin and thick disk populations account for a large fraction, um, about 95% uh, at least of the stars in the Milky Way bulge. And um, we, we, um, we looked at a number of, of different things. We also looked at how this model would reproduce the kinematics, the, the morphology uh, in more detail in, in, in uh, all of these papers. And we really found that the these kinds of isolated and tailored simulations of the thin and the thick disk reproduce very well the chemodynamical properties of the Milky Way bulge. And this really suggests that the bulge of the Milky Way has this kind of in situ or disk origin. It's made up of these disk populations. Now, of course, um, a very interesting question to ask is, okay, but can we reproduce such a pure disk formation scenario in the lambda CDM cosmological context where we know that mergers are of course very important, especially for massive galaxies. And so we would expect to have some uh, amount of spheroid in the inner regions of this galaxy. So to answer this question, we went and looked at the Auriga simulations. This is a suite of um, more than 30 high resolution cosmological zoom in simulations where you can trace um, uh, the formation of galaxies and you can trace the dark matter, the gas density and um, uh, the stars as they form from, from high redshifts down to redshift zero. And you can take into account you know, the cosmological context and each of these um, halos has a different merger uh, history, a different formation history. And you can see that you know, by, by kind of uh, redshift one already in many of these galaxies, um, as the one, for example, shown here, you have this nice barred spiral galaxy forming. Um, so what we did in this study was we went and we looked at the galaxies that have a prominent uh, boxy peanut bulge at redshift zero in these cosmological simulations, since we know that our Milky Way has a boxy peanut bulge. And we went and we studied in detail the chemokinematic properties of these um, of stellar populations in these cosmological simulations. So for example, one thing we looked at was the line of sight velocity and the velocity dispersion as a function of galactic longitude. And um, what we looked at was how these, how the stellar populations in the Milky Way look first. So this is looking at stars in the Milky Way bulge from the Argos survey and separating these stars into these three metallicity bins. So metal rich uh, is red, uh, intermediate metallicities is blue and metal poor is green. And um, you see how the metal rich and the metal poor populations in the Milky Way bulge all seem to rotate quite similar. Though the metal poor population has a higher velocity dispersion. And then we went and we observed our cosmological simulations in the same way that we observed the Milky Way bulge. 
and um, and saw how what these actually um, look like. And so this is what's shown here for one case for Ariga 18. You see how again separating the colors are, are in this, show the same kind of separation in metallicity. And for example, here you see that in this case, Ariga 18. Um, the metal poor population is rotating quite similarly to the metal rich population, not as similar as in the Milky Way, but, but quite similar. Um, and it has a, a higher velocity dispersion, um, quite similar to the trends seen in the Milky Way. Um, if we go and look at another galaxy, however, in, this, um, in these cosmological simulations, for example, Riga 26, here we see a very different um, uh, behavior. So here we see that the metal poor population is rotating very slowly, much more slowly than the metal rich population. And the um, velocity dispersion of this metal poor component is, is much higher. So it overshoots also what, it, what is seen in the Milky Way. So this metal poor component in the bulge um, will have very different properties depending on the halo's formation history, as, as one might expect. So we actually, um, so this is what um, the, the chemo, uh, kinematic properties of the five galaxies we explore look like. And so you see that in some cases, Ariga 17 and 18, they look quite similar to the Milky Way in terms of the metal poor population rotating very similarly to the metal rich population. And then you have examples like Ariga 26, where you see that the metal poor population rotates very slowly. And so we went and actually compared this to the formation um, history of these galaxies. And so if you just focus on this panel here, what I'm showing is the star formation rate as a function of look back time um, in black. This is for the total, uh, for the whole uh, galaxy, uh, for the whole bulge region. And then the red, blue, and green is uh, looking at populations with these three different metallicity bins. And so you see that the metal poor population is, is you know, forms very early on in the galaxy, uh, in the galaxy's lifetime, of course, as you'd expect. And what I want you to focus on are these lines at the top here. So these lines indicate all the mergers uh, more massive than I believe 10 to the six solar masses that take place in this galaxy. And what you and the, the color coding gives you the stellar mass ratio of the merger. So light color means that it was a very low mass ratio merger, so a very insignificant merger. And a darker color means that it was a more massive major merger. So in the case of Ariga 18, you see that it has um, very few mergers in the last 12 giga years. And um, these are quite low mass uh, ratio mergers. Um, and you see something similar as well for Ariga 17. So you see that, uh, which is the other galaxy that matches very well the properties of the Milky Way bulge. You see that it has very few mergers and the, the, the mergers that it does have are very kind of low mass mergers, low, low mass ratio mergers. Whereas if we look at something like Ariga 26, which has this very slowly rotating metal pore component, you see that it has these two um, uh, quite significant uh, major mergers taking place um, within the last 12 giga years. So what this um, told us is that um, for Ariga bulges to have chemokinematic properties that are consistent with the Milky Way bulge, the last massive merger needs to have taken place um, at redshifts above 3.5, so more than 12 giga years ago. Because um, if there is any um, merger, um, kind of significant merger taking place after this time, then the metal pore population uh, rotates too slowly to be compatible with the what we see in the Milky Way bulge. Um, and so this uh, places interesting constraints on the mass of mergers that happen after 12 giga years ago. So for example, um, the um, well-known Gaia Enceladus or sausage merger, which is thought to have happened between nine to 11 giga years ago um, in the Milky Way. And so um, our model suggests that this needs to be quite a low mass ratio merger with um, stellar mass ratio less than one to 20 in order to not disturb the kinematic properties of the metal pore population in the bulge of the Milky Way. Hmm. And I just want to, did someone say something? Okay. Uh, and I just wanted to um, highlight uh, here. So, um, um, when, uh, when does, uh, do a little brief detour, since I'm talking about the Gaia and the sausage, and tell you a little bit about when the Milky Way bar forms. 
So um, there's been evidence, um, recent evidence from, from observations that suggests that the bar of the Milky Way formed uh, soon after this guy Ansel the Sausage merger. So I already mentioned um, the work by Jason Sanders, but there's also been work by uh, Wiley and coll collaborators um, that find that the bar of the Milky Way is quite old, around eight giga years. And this seems to be similar to the kind of the time range which we think this guy Ansel uh, merger took place. So um, with um, uh, uh, collaborators at LJMU, um, in particular, this was work led by um, Alex, who is the second year PhD student at LJMU. We went and we looked at um, some of our cosmological simulations, in particular, the ones that look the most like the Milky Way, such as Auriga 18. And um, we wanted to explore the link between the Gaia and Solidus sausage merger and the bar. So what I'm showing you here, this is this this is a, this Auriga 18 galaxy, which is very similar to um, has very similar chemodynamical properties to the Milky Way's bulge. And uh, Alex explored the formation of the bar in this galaxy, and it's also important to note that this galaxy has a Gaia Enceladus sausage-like merger that takes place. And here you can actually see, here you see the uh, the distance of this Gaia Enceladus sausage-like merger. Um, and you see that it has its first percentic passage uh, around nine-ish uh, giga years ago, and um, it merges with the galaxy um, already, yeah, sometime around 8.5 or 9 giga years ago. Um, and so what, it, what is shown here on the top panel, this is um, look back time and radius on the y-axis, and the color coding is the bar strength, um, A2. And what you can see is that um, the bar, uh, you have, you know, in the you have a well-established bar that's there, a long-lived bar that's there for for many giga years, and this seems to form. This bar seems to form right around the um, first uh, pericentric passage of the GES merger. So um, we see that this bar forms right around, um, yeah, the first pericentric passage of the GES merger in this galaxy. Um, so we wanted to see. Okay, what what happens if um, the relation between the the jazz and the and the bar formation? So one one of the things that Alex did was to go and actually um, find all the um, uh, particles associated to this guy and sell the sausage um, merger, remove them at a very early time from the simulation. Um, so basically, to remove this guy and sell the sausage merger from happening in this galaxy. So. On the left here, you see uh, what the galaxy looks like at seven giga years ago in the original simulation. So when it has this Gaia and Solid sausage merger happening. And on the right hand side, you see the same galaxy, but now with the Gaia and Solid sausage removed. And um, you see that when the jazz is removed, um, the, the bar takes a lot longer to form. So, and we found that bar formation is delayed by over two giga years when uh, the jazz is removed from the simulation. Um, and from a number of other uh, things that uh, Alex looked like, and it looked at um, in their paper, which uh, I don't have much time to go into, we found that the jazz seems to really trigger the bar essentially by a tidal torques, but also by inducing a lot of gas inflows because it's a gas rich uh, merger. Um, and both of these enable the rapid buildup of the stellar disk and therefore the formation. Um, um, well, sorry, the, the gas inflows in, in, induces this rapid buildup of the stellar disk, and this coupled with the tidal torques really triggers the formation of the bar in, in this Milky Way-like analog galaxy. Mm. Um, so we really found that the jazz is, the, the guy and the sausage merger is really tightly related to the formation of the bar and seems to have actually triggered it. Okay, so going back to what I was telling you about um, before, so if, we, if we're now, again, looking at the chemokinematic properties of these Eureka galaxies, these cosmological simulations, and we look at the difference between the metal-rich and the metal-poor population at the edge of the bulge, um, uh, and we normalize this to the rotation of the metal-rich component, we can get this kind of um, delta V parameter, which quantifies the difference between the metal-rich and the metal-poor component in the bulge. Um, which is shown on the y-axis here. And here on the x-axis, we're showing a, a kind of parameter that tries to summarize the impact that mergers have. So it sums over all the mergers um, in the galaxy 
and sums their, their mass ratio divided by the redshift at which the merger happened. So saying if you have a larger mass ratio merger, this will have a big impact. But if this has it happens at very high redshift, it won't have as big an impact because it'll be very gas rich. And so on the right, you have kind of more mergers that have a larger impact. On the left, you have fewer mergers that have a, a less significant impact. And you can see this, this kind of correlation here where we have in galaxies where you have a more mergers, you have a larger difference between the metal rich and metal poor component in the bulge. Um, and uh, the ones that where the metal rich and metal poor component are very similar in the bulge, they have fewer mergers with a smaller impact. Um, and um, so the, the Milky Way uh, in, in the Milky Way bulge lies somewhere down here. So we can we can measure this difference between the metal rich and the metal poor component, and it's very small. And so if, if we follow this trend, you know, kind of downwards, it would tell us that the Milky Way would lie um, somewhere down here. So this is telling us that the Milky Way's formation history must have been very quiescent. Um, so it makes up the kind of the tail of the distribution with the with its last major merger happening 12 giga years ago. Um, uh, so, so this kind of formation scenario is is possible within Lambda CDM. So you 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 do have Milky Way mass galaxies that have these kinds of formation scenarios, but it's it's really kind of at the tail of the quiescent end. Um, and if we go and we look at these, um, the two, the galaxies that we, we studied in the sample, and we look at the fraction of accreted stars in the bulge, uh, which is shown in red here, we see that in the two galaxies that are the most similar to the Milky Way in terms of their chemodynamic properties, um, we see that they have a very small fraction of XC2 stars in the bulge. So really these, these the bulges in these two cosmological simulations are essentially mostly made up of in C2 populations. So this uh, points to the fact that galaxies with chemodynamical properties that are similar to the Milky Way have less than 1% of XC2 stars in the bulge region. So the Milky Way really seems to be, uh, Milky Way bulge really seems to be an in situ bulge. Um, and the Milky Way galaxy, this tells us that the Milky Way galaxy has had a very quiescent merger history. Um, but okay, there are some mergers that happen, of course, in, in the Milky Way, at least early on. Um, and we want to go and and it, what happened? We want to also study this one percent of the um, uh, of stars in the bulge of the Milky Way that have this XC two origin. So where do those? Where does that one percent come from? What kind of mergers does it come from? So first of all, if we want to go and 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 study these XC two um, um, stars, uh, these XC two stellar populations. What these what we're finding from the cosmological simulations is that we really need to go and look at metallicities below minus one. So if we look at metallicities below minus one, we start to see non-negligible fractions of XC2 stars in, in the bulges of these galaxies. And so we really need um, surveys that are targeting these very metal poor populations because um, if you remember from the metallicity distribution functions I was showing you of the of the bulge earlier. Um, you know, most of the stars in the bulge are above minus one. There's very, very few stars that, in the bulge that have metallicity below minus one. So if you just randomly target stars in the bulge, you will very not you will not likely you will not be likely to pick up these very low metallicity stars. So you need targeted surveys that are trying to find these low metallicity stars. Um, a nice example being, uh, for example, the Pig Survey led by um, Anke Aronson. Um, and if we want to, um, but if we want to, um, you know, study these metal poor populations, um, it's really challenging to make predictions from current cosmological simulations because at these low metallicities, we start to run into issues with Poisson noise. And so to, um, because we have very few um, stellar particles with these kinds of low metallicities. And so to um, am ameliorate this issue, we've been running um, a new set of simulations called the Auriga Superstar simulations where, which are essentially very high resolution um, analogs to the milk, to kind of re-simulations of the original Auriga simulations, where we have a hundred times, about a hundred times higher stellar resolution um, in these simulations. So what can we do with these kinds of simulations? Well, for example, if you take the original Auriga simulation and you say, okay, I want to look at the, the metal poor stars in the bulge. So you select stars within these, the inner regions and you select the stars that have metallicity below minus one. This is what you see here in these uh, color. This color coding shows you the accreted stars below metallicity of minus one. Um, 
in the inner regions of the galaxy. Um, and if you, um, but if we look at something like Auriga superstars, where we have a hundred times more resolution, this is the kind of um, resolution that we get in the inner regions. Um, so you see that there's much higher resolution there. Um, and this is work that's being led um, by uh, Thomas Tomlinson, who is a first year uh, PhD student here at Durham, who is um, exploring these um, very high resolution simulations and exploring these uh, the, the metapore populations in the inner regions of the bulge to try and identify um, the earliest mergers that take place in these kinds of Milky Way-like galaxies. Okay, and in the little time that I have left, I want to just briefly uh, touch on this on the second topic, which is the dark matter content of barred galaxies. So um, with some uh, very recent uh, work that was uh, that we put out recently, um, we explored the difference in the dark matter content of uh, barred and unbarred galaxies in Auriga. So that's one of the things we looked at in this paper that was out on archive a couple of days ago. Um, and so what we see if we look at barred and unbarred galaxies in Auriga is that if we look, for example, at the M star M halo relation, we see that the barred galaxies, which are shown in red, for a given halo mass, have a, a higher stellar mass than the unbarred galaxies that are shown in blue. And if we go and we look at now the baryon dominance of these galaxies, so we look at the um, circular velocity from the stellar component over the total circular velocity, we see that the barred population has a, a higher baryon dominance than the unbarred population. Um, and this makes sense because if you have a more baryon dominated galaxy, you'll be more likely to form a bar. You'll be more unstable to bar formation. But one interesting consequence of this is that if we go and look at the Tully-Fisher relation, um, there's there's something interesting that pops out there. So if we look at the uh, stellar mass, uh, the Tully-Fisher relation, the, the stellar Tully-Fisher relation, so we're looking at stellar mass versus um, circular velocity um, at 30 kpc, which should correspond approximately to the V-flat. Um, this is the kind of Tully-Fisher relation we get um, if we look at all the barred and unbarred galaxies together. Um, this is uh, very compatible with what's seen in, in, in kind of observations. Um, and has a very uh, low intrinsic scatter. Um, however, if we fit, um, if we now fit separately the barred and unbarred population, we see that the uh, barred population is offset from the unbarred population in the Tully Fisher relation. And that this offset, um, I mean, it's it, it kind of, you know, it's of course within the intrinsic scatter, but is. Um, is the same, uh, is also 0 0.05. So this offset is just at the, the borders of this intrinsic scatter. Um, so if, um, if we can find this kind of offset in observations, this intrinsic scatter in, in um, different galaxy populations, this um, would be very interesting because this is quite challenging to explain such an offset, for example, in a modified gravity framework such as MOND, um, where you, you do not have any intrinsic scatter um, in the Tully-Fisher relation. It's, um, so, yeah, so this would really point to, to you know, kind of add additional um, uh, evidence uh, for, for dark matter if we were able to find such an offset between barred and unbarred populations in the Tully-Fisher relation. Okay, and um, if we, as I mentioned before, uh, just at the beginning of the talk, um, bars are also connected to dark matter because of this effect of dynamical friction. So if we have a, a bar within a, a disk galaxy, um, we have this, so, so in a disk galaxy, we have this kind of angular frequency uh, curve, which is decreasing as a function of radius. And if we have a bar with a given pattern speed, there will be a radius at which the, um, the angular frequency of stars in the disk rotates at the same angular frequency as the bar. And this is called the corotation radius. Now, if um, you have a lot of dynamical friction in a galaxy, which slows down the rotation of the bar, this will increase the uh, corotation radius in, in this galaxy. Um, however, dynamical friction is kind of not thought to affect um, the length of the bar itself. And so if you have a lot of dynamical friction, you might expect that the ratio of the corotation radius to the bar length um, to increase with time. Um, and uh, this was explored in um, some early works by De Batista and Selwood um, from the early 2000s, uh, late 90s, 
where they uh, ran a number of simulations and they looked at this ratio of the quotation radius over the bar radius as a function of how baryon dominated the disk is. So how much the, the, the disk dominates over the dark matter component uh, within the galaxy. And you see that for higher uh, galaxies which have high, um, oh, sorry, uh, galaxies that have high baryon dominance have a very small ratio of the quotation radius to the bar radius, so it's close to one. Whereas those that are um, very dark matter dominated have a higher ratio of the quotation radius to the bar radius. Now, um, what do uh, observations find? Well, one, one way to go and look at this is to look at the quotation radius here on the y-axis versus the bar length. And um, people tend to separate bars into slow and fast, depending on whether the ratio is above or below 1.4. Um, so uh, observational studies tend to find that uh, bars are fast, so that bars lie within this uh, region here. And this seems to suggest that there's not been much of an effect of dynamical friction on these galaxies. Now, in terms of what um, cosmological simulations have been finding in the past few years, um, it's only recently that we've been able to start to use cosmological simulations to, to kind of study bar dynamics in a, in a kind of large, in a large scales, a significant level, because um, large cosmological simulations like big box cosmological simulations um, have only kind of in recent years had the resolution um, that allows them to, to uh, really resolve the internal dynamics of um, disk galaxies so that we can study bar, bar dynamics. So um, there's been a couple of studies, uh, there were a couple of studies, one using Eagle, the Eagle cosmological simulations and one using the illustrious simulation. Uh, by Al Gore in 2017 and Peshkin and collaborators in 2019, who looked at the um, this ratio, the quotation radius over the bar length in these cosmological simulations. And what they found um, is that the bars in these cosmological simulations are very slow. So you see this is in log scale here, and this is where the um, bar galaxies lie. And also in Peshkin et al, they found that this ratio is much larger than, than kind of 1.4. So this would suggest that these uh, in these cosmological simulations, the galaxies lie up here, um, which is clearly incompatible with the observations. Um, there's were also uh, subsequently more recent studies that looked at this in TNG 50 and TNG 100 uh, by Roshan and collaborators. And they also found that these bars are very slow and they found a 10 sigma discrepancy between observations and the TNG simulations. Um, so uh, this is where TNG would lie. And so this, Kind of raises the question, are fast bars incompatible with the Lambda CDM framework? So um, can we not have um, uh, fast bars when we have this kind of um, cold dark matter? Now we went and explored this also in the Auriga simulations. Um, and I was quite surprised when we when we did this, we actually found in Auriga that the uh, barred galaxies seem to be quite fast and they seem to lie uh, Kind of very similar to where the observations lie. Um, and so we found that you know bars in, in Auriga are fast and they are, these are in agreement with observations, but these are also uh, simulations run in Lambda CDM, in the Lambda CDM context. So this oh. of course raises the question of why are some lambda, why are some simulations um, finding that bars are fast, whereas others are finding that bars are slow? What's the difference between Auriga and the other cosmological simulations? Um, so we looked at a few different things. We looked at the effects of resolution, disk thickness, gas fraction. I don't have time to go through these, but basically we didn't find that these play a role. What we did find that was different um, in Auriga compared to Eagle and Illustrious is that the Auriga galaxies are more baryon dominated than the galaxies in Illustrious and Eagle. Um, and this has as a consequence that if we look at the M star M halo relation, the uh, galaxies in Auriga lie above the M star M halo relation of uh, illustrious and eagle. And um, this is because most uh, cosmological simulations like big box cosmological simulations try and match the abundance matching relations, uh, for example, the one by Moster et al. And so they try and get galaxies, they implement feedback recipes and star formation and feedback recipes to try and match um, the abundance matching relation. Whereas in Auriga, the galaxies lie above the abundance matching relation. And they are therefore more baryon dominated. Um, 
Now, interestingly, um, there was some recent studies um, um, by Lorenzo Posti and collaborators who looked at massive spiral galaxies in the spark sample, and they found that these massive spiral galaxies also actually tend to lie. These are observed spiral galaxies, right? They tend to lie above the abundance matching relation. Um, and this seems, and this is these gray points here, and this seems to match um, this kind of trend that we see um, in Auriga as well. So, um, yeah, this is this is from this study by Posti, and they found that these massive spirals lie above the abundance matching relation. So what this is telling us is that um, it seems that broad galaxies actually should be baryon dominated, and they should lie above the abundance matching relation in order to also have dynamical properties that are consistent with those of observed bars. So in order to have fast bars, you need to be uh, above this abundance matching relation. Um, and this um, this is the general kind of problem that cosmological simulations have, which is that um, they, they seem to actually not be as baryon dominated as um, kind of dynamical modeling suggests. So for example, if we look at the some dynamical modeling that's been done for the Milky Way that decomposes the galaxy into the disk and the halo, um, this is the halo component. You see that the disk is, is dominating over the dark matter halo. Um, if we look at the gal Milky Way-like galaxies in illustrious TNG, um, this is what their dark matter halo looks like in this green line, and this is what the dark matter halo is um, su suggested by dynamical modeling of the Milky Way galaxy, so uh, of the Milky Way. So essentially, we're finding that um, cosmological simulations see tend to have too much dark matter. The dark matter halos tend to be too concentrated compared to what we're seeing in, in um, dynamical models of massive spiral galaxies. So I'm a little bit over time, so I will just very, um, very briefly mention the work by um, Alex Brook, who was a master's student here at Durham, who wanted to explore the effects of subgrid physics on bar dynamics. So what, what Alex did was to take the Auriga simulations and then rerun exactly the same galaxy with the same initial conditions, same merger history, but using slightly different uh, physics. So slightly different kind of subgrid um, prescriptions and using the, basically using the, the TNG model um, because if you remember earlier, I was telling you that also in TNG, they find very slow bars. And uh, what Alex found was that if we take the same exact galaxy and run it now, instead of with the Auriga galaxy formation model, we run it with the TNG model, that the ratio of curly R, so the ratio of corotation radius to bar length, um, is much increases in the, um, in the galaxy when we run it with the TNG model than when we run it with Auriga. So even small changes to the subgrid physics um, can really have significant effects on the dynamical properties of bars and they can lead to the slowdown of bars. So I'm just gonna go to my conclusions and say, um, so on the formation history of the Milky Way, what we find by studying these isolated and cosmological simulations is that the, the Milky Way has an unusually quiescent merger history with its last major merger taking place uh, above uh, 3.5. And that therefore the bulge of the Milky Way and the inner regions of the Milky Way are formed predominantly in situ from thin and thick disk populations. And we see that the, the Gaia Enceladus uh, merger really seems to trigger bar formation um, through tidal forces and gas inflows. And in terms of the dark matter content of barred galaxies, we find that bars uh, are compatible with, with lambda CDM. They can be fast in lambda CDM. But in order for this to happen, massive spiral galaxies need to be baryon dominated and they need to be offset from the abundance matching relation. And we see that small changes in subgrid physics can really affect this stellar to dark matter ratio, um, which is what sets how fast bars can be. And so we can really use bar dynamics to try and constrain our galaxy formation models. Okay, and I will stop there. Thank you very much for listening. So many thanks, Francesca, for this uh, really, very, really, very, very interesting talk. I think there are questions here, maybe in the room or outside. We can start our discussion. Uh, well, there are many. Well, actually, uh, if we start discussion, I'm afraid we will have uh, to talk for uh, as much as uh, the length of the talk was. So just uh, let me ask just a few things. So you had uh, models, galaxy models that had a bar and uh, models that didn't develop a bar. So which was the main uh, property of the model that did this uh, distinction? In the cosmological simulations, yes. you mean? Yes. Um, 
it, so there were a few different um, things that seem to drive this that we discuss in the paper. One is the baryon dominance. So, um, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so, so, so basically how baryon dominated the galaxy is seems to affect it. Um, the other thing that we found was that the galaxies, um, unbarred galaxies tend to have a higher fraction of excitu stars in the bulge. So they seem to have been more affected by mergers, let's say recent mergers that have heated up the, the inner regions. Um, so they have a higher XC2 fraction in the bulge. And then the other um, thing that we found was that also the tumor Q parameter was higher, is higher for the unbarred galaxies than the barred ones as well. So all the things you would expect. So it seems that the mergers are also playing a significant role. The, bar dom uh, the, the baryon dominance is also. Yes, right? yes, yes. Okay, very nice. And also, well, uh, when you say that uh, if uh, in the models corrotation is uh, due to dynamical friction is pushed outwards, but the mm -hmm. bar length doesn't change, this has to do, I guess, also with the rate at which the deceleration of uh, the pattern speed is done. Because if there is enough time, there is no reason why particles wouldn't be trapped up in the resonance where it would be located. It's not only the corrotation that moves outwards, all the other resonance so the X1 orbits would support uh, in higher, yes. larger distance from the center. Yes, right. yes. I, I mean, I guess, yeah, maybe you said it, I said it in a bit too much of a simplified way. Of course, the bar length can also change, but it's just that the slowdown, so the increase in the corrotation radius seems to be much uh, more dominant or much faster, let's say, like that seems to overtake how much the bar length seems to grow. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Well, uh, just two questions, comments, and I think that we will have in a few months more time to discuss it. <laughs> but I liked, or I, I, it was, I found very interesting, two of the simulations, the snapshots you were say, uh, showing. Um, in a Milky Way model, uh, it was clearly seen that there was a peanut for the cold uh, disk and a peanut also for the hot, for the thick disk. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? So we have uh, at least in the model, I don't know if we have some observational evidence for that. Also, a peanut in the thick disk in the Milky Way or in a model. Yes. So, so well, it depends what you define as thick disk. Like what kind of metallicities you're you're thinking about. We had in the simulation, so it was something that was a very sharp defined uh, peanut, yes. say bulge, whatever it was in uh, in the thin disk. And then it was uh, something more or less sharply defined, but it was certainly also a peanut. Well, I think this one. Let me also. Yes. Yeah. So so um so yeah. if you were to to take um so yeah in the thick disk you can still see a peanut, mm -hmm. but it's much less well defined. So you you if depending on how you try and observe this, you might not be able to see the double peak. So for example. Um, you know, if you looked at one given line of sight, mm. um, um, so as we do, for example, we look from the solar neighborhood, you know, you look towards the, the bulge of the Milky Way um, and you look along a given um, a line of sight, you might not be able to intercept the two lobes of the peanut in this case in the thick disk because it's much weaker. Whereas, for example, here, if you look um towards the bulge, you will very easily intercept the two lobes of the peanut and say, okay, I can clearly see evidence for the peanut there. Um, so it, you can see the peanut in the Milky Way also as you go to more metal poor populations, but at which point you stop being able to see it. Um, yeah, so very more, for very metal, low metal elicity populations, you don't seem to be able to see this double peak. Um, of, a, of the peanut in the Milky Way. But this is also something that we can understand in this kind of scenario because it becomes just much weaker. And so it's much harder to see this double lobe, this double. Especially they occupy the same uh, area. So I don't see that the thick peanut, uh, let's say, is uh, uh, goes to higher distances uh, than the, the cold one here in the-, in the... Let me see uh, if I have a plot to- uh, yes, for example, maybe here, right. So can you see these slides? Yeah. Yeah. So for example, if you were to take cuts at different heights above the plane in this cold and hot com uh, component, mm -hmm. um, this is what you would see. So um, cl 
close to the plane. So for this, um, like this cut here, close to the plane, um, the cold component, uh, you would see a single peak and you would see a single peak for the hot component. Mm -hmm. Now, as you move to larger heights above the plane, um, you start intercepting in the cold component, this double peak. So you see the double lobe in the cold component, but you see you still cannot see it for the hot component yet. You still only see a single peak. And then when you go to even higher um, distances from the plane, you then see it much more prominently in the cold population, and you also start to see it in the hot population. So they will not always show up necessarily, the, the, the double peak will not show up necessarily at exactly the same heights for the cold and hot population. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah. Well, I, I think there is a, a lot of things that one has discussed here, but uh, as I see, it's not now maybe the time to have, we want also some, maybe to ask things. But uh, uh, the, the real question I have behind this uh, mm -hmm. mark is that uh, do all orbital families, since we have the same potential, do orbital families can reproduce these properties in, uh, in a peanut if you consider a high and low dispersion uh, population? If we, Okay, we have that. And then the, the very last mm. one is uh, uh, you had uh, some orbits of uh, dark, uh, of, the, of the halo or something. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And these were uh, somehow, yeah, I think it must be this one, yeah. And these uh, were exactly, and they were, are they along the z-axis of the, the rotational axis of the orbits, uh, the one to the right? So this is the same orbit. Uh, it's the same orbit seen uh, face on and edge ah, on. Ah, okay, I got yes. it. Okay, okay. Yes, yes, okay. yes. Thank you. Okay, so let me see if there are other questions and comments here in the audience or for for other people that follow it. So uh, uh, either raise a hand or please uh, just speak because I do not have full control here. Let me see. No. Okay. It's a, a long talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, it was it was really very very interesting. <laughs> so well, as I said, we will have uh, time to discuss uh, very soon. So thank you very much again. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And thank you. See you soon, Pana. See you soon. Yeah, right. Bye. Bye.